you need is a, a point in the plane, which we have. That's our point A. And the other thing you should have, see if I can figure out which way this is pointing here, some kind of normal vector. And from those, you can write down the equation from a formula that we derived last time. You can also find it in your book. So assuming we know how to do that, the question is how can we get that information from the givens up here? Okay, we have the point A. Somehow we have to get our normal from this information right here. Now, uh, this is, I guess, partly experience and partly preference. And certain problems, I try to be very specific about the pictures and try to give you a, a legitimate gr a sketches in three space <coughs> with respect to a given coordinate system. Uh, this is one of those problems where I would not do that personally. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I don't find it that it's that useful. Here are my two planes that uh, supposedly will work. We have gamma 1 and gamma 2. I guess I'll label them over here. <coughs> Here's the line of intersection. And let's assume that the point that we're given is out here somewhere. And the plane we're after might look something like this. There's our point A. So those are the specifications. Here are two planes, line of intersection. Our plane that we're supposed to find is perpendicular to both planes to the line of intersection and passes through point A. Now, in terms of what I just showed you, what we need is a normal vector. Perhaps we'll put it right here. <coughs> Once we have a normal vector, then we're in great shape. Well, again, you look at the picture, and if you've drawn one that's reasonable, you'll notice that the normal vector is parallel <coughs> to the line. And of course, a line, basically, as far as we're concerned, is uh, specified by a point and a, uh, a direction vector, a <coughs> parallel direction vector, as opposed to a perpendicular one for a plane. So it looks like this thing right here, the normal we're looking for, could be gotten from looking at a, a direction for that particular line. Now, where do we get the line from? It's from the curve of intersection, line of intersection, actually, of these two planes. So somehow we've got to manipulate those two planes in order to get the line of intersection, to get the parallel vector, and we've got our normal. <coughs> As I suggested last time, it actually turns out to be fairly easy because, again, both of these planes, in effect, contain information about normals. If you look at the equations, you can read off a normal for plane 1. You can do the same thing for plane 2. And as I s suggested last time, the normal we seek for our new plane can be gotten as the cross product of N1 and N2. Let me pull those vectors off so you can see that more clearly. These are free vectors, so we can move them around. Here's N1. Here's N2. And the normal that we seek is perpendicular to both and therefore can be gotten as a cross product. Now, let's take it at least one step further, and that is to get a cross product. We haven't done one of those for a while. Might use that determinant <coughs> mnemonic, which says simply place the components of each vector, n1 and n2, in the second and third rows, and, and go to town. Okay, so what I need are the normal vectors. I said last time, if you look at the coefficients of the equation for your plane, those will be the components of a normal vector. In other words, 1, 3, minus 5 will be components of a normal vector for gamma 1. Similarly, we got a 6, minus 1, plus 1 for gamma 2. So the normal vector, if we expand this out, would be a 3 minus a 5 
times i. For j, we have a negative sign, and we have a plus 1 and a plus 30, so it'll be a negative 31 j. And for k, minus 1, minus 18, looks like a minus 19. So when I took my normal vectors in that particular order, that's what I get for my cross product. So here's the vector that we needed. Okay, we were given a point. Let me copy down the, the coordinates again. A, 1, 2, minus 3. So the equation that we need, you get right off of this, and that would be, uh, uh, it doesn't make any difference. I just feel better if I make all these pluses. You can see that all I'm doing is changing the direction of the normal. If you uh, worry about the one I've drawn, then I could call that negative m. It doesn't make any difference. One normal or the other just gets rid of a negative sign all the way through. So to write down my equation, I would take these coefficients, these components, 2 times x minus 1 plus 31 times y minus 2 plus 19 times z minus a minus 3 equals 0. And that, except for little slips here and there, would be the equation that we're after. Okay, I don't want to drive you into the ground with this notion, but notice that basically it was an algebraic statement yielding an algebraic answer, but almost all the intermediate steps are, again, in terms of vectors. And that's, uh, again, I think a, a good example of the power of vectors. I really would have had a hard time, I think, trying to even see what this picture looks like, that is, graphically. But if you see it in terms of vectors, which are free vectors, you can move them around and manipulate them out here, if you like, using right-hand rule, cross products, all that other stuff, all that good stuff allows you to get to the answer fairly quickly. So as you do all your problems for the plane, if you haven't done them yet, notice that almost all of them come back to basically the same idea, and that is you need a point in the plane and some normal vector. And it's up to you to scout around and say, well, gee, from what's given, this is how I get the normal vector, and then go at it. Okay, there was a question earlier about uh, a problem on lines. Let's take a look at that. This was on page 654. Number 13, we might check to see if I copied this one down right, because it uh, is kind of critical. It's critical because we're supposed to determine whether or not these lines, let's call them L1 and L2, whether or not they intersect, and if they intersect, what's the point of intersection? I don't think we need to be <coughs> too careful at this point either. It's nice to be able to graph lines, but for the most part, I don't think it's of any help at this, at least in this particular problem. The question is, is there a point of intersection? That's even a little bit hard to describe in terms of a picture because, uh, as far as you know, we're looking down past the first line and somewhere behind it's the second line. The question is, does that happen or does it not? If there is a point of intersection, then what you should realize, and this is something else I've been trying to get across, is that a point is on L1 if and only if it satisfies these parametric equations for L1 for some t. A point's on the line if and only if its coordinates, in a sense, are given or satisfy the parametric equations up here for a, a specific t. The same thing is true here for L2. X, Y, Z is on this line at uh, V equals V0. 
Think of that as another time scale, if you like. <coughs> and what we're asked to do is to show whether or not there is a common point of intersection, let's say it's x1, y1, z1, at not only t equals t1, but also simultaneously, I guess, v equals v1. That's what we mean by an intersection point. In a sense, both lines collide at the same time frame, maybe on different time scales. So a common point of intersection really corresponds to a common t and v value. So what we're supposed to do is come up here and say, well, is there some way that we can uh, ascertain what those might be if they exist? Is there some way you can figure out what T1 and V1 should be? Well, if so, let's, let's take a look at our equations up here. For example, if this thing exists, then X1 is 1 plus 2T1. At the same time, <coughs> X1 is 4 minus V1. I'm looking at both lines and checking that if there is a point of intersection, that point has the same x-coordinate for a couple of time values. That should be true. And that's going to be true for all the coordinates. We should also have that y1 is 1 minus 4t1, and y1 is also minus 1 plus 6v1, and same for z. And up to this point, uh, it's just a matter of understanding what we're after. Now you have to get a little bit algebraic. We're away from vectors and things. Um, notice that vectors really don't <coughs> directly enter into the problem. Vectors are free vectors, and you don't talk about intersecting vectors. They're free to move about. It's not really a, a problem for them. And so it's pretty much an algebraic problem as I see it. Well, I think I'm going to just start out with the first equation our equations, notice that we have basically two variables over here related to one variable here. And what I'm going to do is substitute in, say that 4 minus v1 is 1 plus 2t1, and solve for v1. I'll put v1 on the right side, and you've got 3 minus 2t1. That would be the relationship between v1 and t1 if there is a point of intersection. Should put a big question mark there. There's no guarantee that there is. I didn't check the back of the book to see if there is supposed to be one. We'll just see how it goes. Again, if there's a point of intersection, then this is the relationship between the two times, the two lines. You can do pretty much the same thing over here, setting these two equal to each other. 1 minus 4t1 equals minus 1 plus 6v1. Setting my y1s equal to one another. and uh, we can accumulate constants here just as well. Uh, perhaps even better, since I have a v1, why don't I just substitute in right here? And what I will have is one equation in one variable. So I can figure out what t1 would have to be by itself. So making that substitution, I'll get 1 minus 4t1 is a minus 1 plus 6 times 3 minus 2t1. And there's my one equation in one unknown, the t variable. 1 minus 4t1 equals minus 1 plus 18 minus 12t1. Let's put t1 <coughs> on this side. 8t1 equals 16, looks like, on the right. And so t1 is to be 2. So if a point of intersection occurs, then T1 will equal 2. Coming up here, plugging back into my V1 equation, I get then that V1 would equal 3 minus 4, or a minus 1. So if there is a point of intersection, notice I say if, because we haven't really established it yet, it will have to occur when v1 is minus 1 and t1 equals 2. 
Now, the thing that keeps us from saying that there is a point of intersection is the fact that we still have to have simultaneously the same z value for the t and v that we just came up with. So now plugging in when t equals 2, we get for this equation a 3. And when v1 equals a minus 1, indeed, we get a 3 here as well. So for those t values, it turns out that z1 equals 3 simultaneously. And from our algebra, either one of these equations will work. 1 minus 4 times t1 is a 1 minus 8, or a minus 7. And back here, with t1 equal 2, looks like we get x1 equals 5. So indeed, there is a point of intersection. And along the way, we found out from the parametric equations at what times on each line that point occurs. That doesn't appeal to me because it doesn't have much vectors. It's mostly an algebraic type problem. OK, let's, uh, let's go on then with a little bit of the new stuff. It kind of dribbles in a little at a time. First thing we're going to talk about are cylinders. Everybody knows what a cylinder is. That's what they put Campbell, Campbell's soup in, although I just saw in the newspaper Campbell's soup's going to go from plain old tin cans to other kinds of shapes and, and uh, materials. But anyway, that's supposedly what a cylinder is. Well, that's not really true. A cylinder that looks like a tin can is really a specific type of cylinder. It's called a right circular cylinder. And we're going to talk about things a, a little bit more general. To get into any of these topics that we're going to get into the next few days, what we have to do is talk about something called a trace. A trace is a curve. Okay, primarily, a trace is a curve of intersection of a plane and a surface, <coughs> which sounds good, but you know, we don't have any examples. And it's kind of hard to draw some. You'll see some in the book. We'll make some rather crude attempts here in class. What I want to do is show you a couple that will come up perhaps in your life. We'll see how it goes. Uh, one of them is this one right here. If you take a look at it as best you can, that turns out to be a surface that you might study in differential equations. There's something called the heat equation of a bar. And what you're supposed to do is graph temperature as a function of both a point on the bar and time. As time goes on, temperature changes. As you move around in the bar for any fixed time, the temperature changes. So if temperature is a function of both position and time, then you've got a function of two variables. As far as we're concerned, this is something like z equals f of x, y. z is a function of x and y, although it's temperature, function of time and position. I don't want to get into the specifics, but what you're looking at, of course, is not the surface itself. I'm holding up a plain sheet of paper. What you're looking at are traces. I've taken planes that are perpendicular to the xy plane or parallel to the xz plane, the yz plane, etc., and made cuts through the surface perpendicular. And what you are looking at are traces, the curves in the surface cut out by the plane, or planes, I should say. You can get a little bit better idea with this other picture. This will come across, I think, in a section or two. This is what you call a saddle surface for obvious reasons. Actually, I should have brought in a more interesting one. There's one called a monkey saddle surface. It's got a uh, place for the tail as well. And then there's a dog saddle surface. You can guess what that one's like. 
But anyway, that's what you call your basic saddle surface. Now this one you can do easily. The one I just showed you, I did myself, took a little bit of time. There's something called 3D Plot Triple Star, a public program in your, in your computer. And basically all you do is tell it what equation you're interested in. It's not that easy, but there, if you read the instructions carefully, you can figure it out. Tell you what equation you're interested in. And you can do something like what you see here. This is probably as crude as it can be. What I've done is thrown in the coordinate axes. And I've also thrown in the traces, which is what I'm talking about right now. Those are, if you look at this particular picture, where planes parallel to the x, z, and the y, z planes, the coordinate planes, pass through the surface. And this also, this 3D plot triple star, has the hidden line algorithm, which allows you to uh, look at the surface without all the traces jumbling one another. If there are uh, traces in behind, then they tend to disappear. Uh, rather well. If you look at the picture fairly closely, you'll see that's the case. Okay. So for those that uh, are interested, you don't have to be a skilled computer expert. If you can read BASIC, you can pretty much use this program. It has instructions. It's very user-friendly. It basically sits there and gives you a menu or asks you for what you want to do next. And what's interesting, I didn't bring in any more pictures, but you can rotate the picture quite easily so you have a different viewpoint any way you want. You can uh, get rid of the hidden line routine. You can do all kinds of things. There's just a whole lot of stuff that you can do there. Well, perhaps as we get into the surfaces and I get a little bit more time to run down a machine that works near me, I'll try to get you some more plots like these. What we're supposed to do, though, is take a look at some of the simpler surfaces. Well, that one as an example. But things that uh, are characteristically the kinds of things that you would run across pretty regularly. Now, this, in the fact, is a review from what we did last time and the time before. x over 8 plus y over 7 equals 1. I suspect if I ask you what that is, you would respond that that is a Good. I caught a lot of you for various reasons. Uh, I don't know that I heard plane out there, but it is a plane in three space. It's not an ellipse because ellipses would have squared x and y. But even so, if you're in three space, it still wouldn't be an ellipse. It still would be some kind of three-dimensional object. And that's what we're going to get into. So let, let me, again, refresh your memory to kind of warn you as well. If you have a straight line in the xy plane, of this form, it's kind of nice because if you let y equal 0, the x-intercept is easily constructed at 8. x equals 0, y equals 7. This is yet another form that perhaps you don't put your lines in, but it is a nice standard form. It's easy to find what the intercepts are by just looking at it. Knowing that it's a straight line in two space, then you get a picture that looks something like this. Now what I said last time was in three space, we say that a point is on this surface If the coordinates satisfy the equation, or if it's a, a 3D straight line, we've got parametric equations, plural. But that's basically what we're after now. Points on a surface in three dimensions if the coordinates of P satisfy the equation. Now notice that there are only specifications on X and Y. So z is free to roam, and that allows me to basically show you that the plane of interest is actually coming straight out at you. That's why you can't see it, maybe. So let's tip this a bit. Looking at this in perspective, here's your straight line down here. I just drew for you. And what you're really looking at is one trace. Okay, this is the xy plane cutting through your surface. What you're looking at is the so-called curve of intersection of the xy plane, which is down here, 
cutting through whatever your surface is. Well, we know what it is, but right now, let's pretend that we don't. So there's one of your traces. Okay, what do your other traces look like? For example, if we let y equals zero, in fact, let me label it down here. This is z equals zero plane. If we let y equals zero, which is the y z plane, <coughs> well, y equals zero, we get x equals eight, and that turns out to be just a straight line in that plane. X equals eight would be something that goes like this in the y z plane. So there's another trace. Same story if I let x equals zero. I'm back there in the y z plane. X equals zero in my equation gives me y equals seven. So in the y z plane, y equals seven would be again a vertical line perpendicular passing through y equals 7. Now, notice I've only given you three traces. By the way, I've already told you what the surface is, so it's uh, not supposed to be a surprise. But I think if I just walked in here today, you'd never seen a plane before and said, well, the surface in question kind of looks like this, maybe your uh, mind is well-tuned enough to look at that and say, gee, it kind of looks flat to me. Or in other words, that's a plane. If you're not satisfied, I could give you other traces. For example, if y equals 1, that would be a plane parallel to the xz plane, one unit down the y-axis. If that's the case, you'd find that you'd get another vertical line looking something like that. If y equals 1, then solving, you get x equals something. It's a weird fraction. I don't want to get into it. But if y equals 1, that's still a plane. Then this curve of intersection, the trace that I have here, turns out to be a straight vertical line that looks like that. And so you can go on. I don't, I don't know that I'm going to help things any, but one could go on and put in more traces like that, more traces like that, and roughly what I'm giving you is the picture that the computer drew, a grid that probably, if you did it properly, would firmly establish in your mind that you're looking at a flat plane, nothing but straight lines. So that's the purpose of a trace, is to get us uh, somehow into three space because we're stuck here, at least in, in this class, on this board right here. Someday we'll have holographic images for you, but not this year, I don't think. So what kinds of problems will you get, a, get in your book? Well, let's look at one of them, in fact, which is an example. Now, probably a classic one as far as I'm concerned. If you had me last semester, whenever I needed a curve, I tended to pull out a parabola in two space. And uh, if you get me next semester, you probably see a paraboloid in three space. And this is what they're supposed to look like. This is a simple one z equals x squared plus y squared. Notice that if I asked that what this is, you probably or shouldn't respond that it's a circle or an ellipse or anything because it's not x squared plus y squared equals a constant. It's actually the third variable. So there is an interrelationship there. Now this example, it's actually in your book there, is to provide you with the notion of traces again. That is uh, what you should look at probably First, are traces in the xy plane, in the xz plane, and in the yz plane. If they exist, that's where I would start. And then <coughs> elsewhere. And that's pretty much up to you. Once you've seen the traces in those planes, you might say, I don't need any more, or Let's take another look at uh, a trace over here. So there's, so, so there's no set pattern. And the problems that you first see are basically sketch as best you can, implicitly, they say, the following surfaces. OK, 
Okay, starting out, let's take a look at our coordinate set. Get ready to go here. And maybe I'll just number these and we'll take them one at a time. Of course, here's why we spent so much time on planes themselves. They turn out to be the important keys to looking at other surfaces. Uh, anyone want to tell me algebraically what the XY plane corresponds to? I mean, you can all come up here and point at it, but what's it mean in terms of X, Y's, and Z's? Z equals zero. Z equals zero, right. Z equals zero. As far as I'm concerned, we're talking about all X, Y, Z's where the altitude Z is zero. That's the X, Y plane. Okay. Z equals one would be a plane parallel to the X, Y plane, one unit up. So if Z equals zero is the X, Y plane, in our particular equation, what we get is zero is X squared plus Y squared. Notice what you do is you just substitute in whatever that constant is that you happen to choose. And what's that look like? It's a point. It's a circle of radius zero, if you like, but uh, not much information right there. In the XY plane, we get that point right there. Now, I might come back and say, gee, there should be something more interesting. Let's move up and down, but let's not do that yet. Let's go to the basics. Part two. What is the XZ plane? Okay, everybody can come over here and point at it. It's this one over here on the left. But algebraically, what is it? Y equals zero. Y equals zero seems to be a popular choice. Y equals zero, then. Take your equation, plug in Y equals zero. You've got Z equals X squared plus zero squared. In other words, Z equals X squared. Now, in the plane, y equals zero, what does z equals x squared look like? It's a parabola. And that's another reason we studied conics a while back. So let me just quickly sketch it right here. If I'm in the xz plane, and this is fair to do, what we're looking at is z equals x squared, which looks like that, kind of. <coughs> and so now with that in mind, I come over here and say, hmm, must be something like this. There's my parabola out there in the xz plane. So that's interesting. That, that seems to give us something. And let's see if we can stick the last one right in here. The yz plane would be when x equals 0. We plug that into our equation. We get z equals y squared. Well, yet again, we get another parabola. Change colors on you here. And that parabola would be in the yz plane, let's say like this. And now you've got to start fishing. Um, I've got a couple of parabolas, one coming down the x-axis, one coming across the y-axis. We've got this point that they pass through. Let's come back and look at more horizontal traces. Looks like there's nothing below the xy plane. If you think about it, that's true. If you look at the kinds of xy's you can plug in, they're only going to produce non-negative z's. So obviously, don't look at any z's that are negative. So my elsewhere, I'd start out with perhaps uh, z equal 4, since I know what I want to do. That helps. z equals 4 is a plane 4 units above and parallel to the xy plane. When I plug it into my equation, we have 4 is z equals x squared plus y squared. That's the equation of a circle, radius 2, if you're interested. And so that particular thing, if we come up here, 4 units supposedly gives me maybe all I need. I don't know. Trying to figure out who is where here. Something like that. That's supposed to be my circle. Now, at this point, I start trying to sell students on not drawing the complete picture, partly because I can't see them. And if I can't see them, no use you drawing them for me. If you like to do it that way, that's fine. But I tend to try to 
reduce the problem to that of a first octant, if possible. That way you can isolate on just a, at least an eighth of the thing and probably see the rest of it just as well. So here we go. This is the way I would have done the problem, or at least if I stuck with that picture, I might backtrack and try it over again. Remember, we had a point down here. We had a parabola coming out at us. Let me not draw the back part. We had a parabola going down the y-axis in the zy plane. And then we had a circle. Of course, I've had practice drawing that picture an awful lot, but that's a quarter of the circle that we were just talking about up here at z equals 4. Now, if you go back and erase a few things, realizing that this thing actually expands upward forever and is around the other three top octants, well, with that a little bit of imagination, you can pretty well see what this thing is. And if you want, you can do some shading, uh, draw more traces, etc. That's up to you. But at least to me, my mind says, hmm, I think I have a pretty good idea what this thing is. It's kind of a bowl shape. Now, twice I mentioned, or you mentioned, in fact, the word parabola, which is uh, perhaps where a lot of these surfaces get their name. If we take a couple of sections through the z-axis, we get parabolas. In fact, if you take any trace, that is, any plane cutting through my surface in any direction through the z-axis, you're going to get a, par a parabola. In fact, you get the same parabola. So what this thing is, as it turns out, is a, if you need a name, a circular paraboloid. This indicates that it's a three-dimensional object, OYD, and it's basically built of, if you think of the traces, circles and parabolas. And basically, it's parabolas, so I guess that's why we call it a circular paraboloid as opposed to a parabolic <coughs> circuloid or something like that. It's basically parabolic in shape. If you were to construct a mirror, radar dish, what have you, that's supposed to have a parabolic shape, this might be one of the items that you look at, some kind of circular paraboloid of this type. If you get more deeply into this topic, you'll find yourself looking at where the focus is, uh, all the other stuff that we did for plane conic sections. I don't think we do much of that, at least in this course. So traces pretty much gave us an idea of what that picture was. And in fact, only uh, three traces, if, if you look at it. Okay, while we're at it, let's look at a similar problem. See how maybe we can do it a little bit more quickly. What if we had, uh, let's, let's do it this way, x squared over 8 plus y squared over 7. That kind of gets us back to a problem we just looked at. Okay, somewhat more quickly now, if I'm looking in the x, y plane, I said z equals 0. Again, that's a point, 0, 0. If I look in the x, z plane, that's when y equals 0. We get z equals x squared over 8, and that, again, is a parabola. So there's the trace in the uh, xz plane. And lastly, when uh, x equals 0 in the yz plane, we get z equals y squared over 7. That, again, is a parabola. Notice they are not the same parabolas. Unlike last time, you get two kinds of parabolas there. Let's take a look at a few elsewheres. We saw before that z equals other numbers is interesting. Let's take z equals 1. Now's the time for that answer I heard a few minutes ago. What's that thing? That's an ellipse. And what you're supposed to be thinking while you're doing this is that, say, OK, one unit above the xy plane. In that horizontal plane, I've got an ellipse. 
How about if I go two units up? What do you get then? An ellipse. And it turns out to be a bigger one. The x and y intercepts, for example, projected into the xy plane will be larger. So as you go up in the z direction, you get ever increasing ellipses. You get parabolas in the two coordinate planes. I'm pretty much ready to go, I think. That is, in terms of drawing this picture. In the, let's see, xy plane, we had a point from 1. When y equals 0, we had this parabola, y, uh, pardon me, z equals x squared over 8. And in the yz plane, we had another parabola. Let me really accentuate the difference. In fact, it's probably wrong, but let's, let's do that anyway. Different parabola, z equals y squared over 7. Those were two traces. And then I just got a couple of ellipses, and they will pretty much fill out the picture, something like that. There's my ellipse. Let's make, make believe it's the second one x squared over 8 plus y squared over 7 equals 2, something like that. Of course, that's only part of the story. There are other parts around the three other octants up top, and as well, this thing extends on forever. We've cut it off. It opens up forever in the z direction. But again, if you want to shade or put in more traces or something, perhaps uh, you should do it or get the computer to do it. You've got a plane up here, nice and flat, no problem with that. And you get, again, the feeling that this is some kind of a bowl shape, although it isn't like the other bowl. I wouldn't use it for a radar dish or anything for that matter. It is not circular. It's elliptical around the z-axis. It has ellipses as cross-sections or traces there. You've got parabolas in the other two directions. So for that reason, I suppose this thing is called an elliptic paraboloid. And very quickly, just as we had with parabolas and planes, the plane conics, you'll find that you'll have problems that maybe look like this. If you think about it, we don't have much time to do that, but if you look at the, the various traces again, you'll find that you'll have a parabola that opens downward this way. In fact, this will cross at 2. Over here in the y direction, crosses at 4, it's 16 up here, and in the xy plane, where z equals 0, you get another ellipse. It looks like this. Okay? And you can fill in what these are as well. So what this is is uh, an inverted bowl, and you can think of it this way. Take z equals 4x squared plus y squared, which is kind of like the one we just talked about. That's a bowl sitting on the origin. If you change the sign of z, that flips it over. It's now sitting up underneath the origin. And then you add 16. That translates it up the z-axis 16 units. So once you've done a bunch of these problems, you should be able to handle situations like that without even sketching it. Say to yourself, gee, that's an inverted paraboloid. Move 16 units up the z-axis inside your mind anyway, perhaps see what that picture really is all about without having to go much trouble. Okay, as I said, in Calc 3s you'll find you'll be interested in physical aspects of these shapes. That is, how much volume is under this elliptical paraboloid above the xy plane. Or if you're doing a, a physics mechanics problem, there's a certain density related to the solid. Where's the center of gravity? What's the moment of inertia? Things of that nature. They all involve surfaces, and of course, to do surfaces well, you have to be able to sketch them. Okay, I challenge you once more, every day as usual, 
go home and do your homework, but this time just be good at sketching. That's about all they ask. We'll see you next time.